Amen. Amen. All God's people said. If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 35. Looking at verses 1 through 10 in the sermon entitled, It's a Wonderful Life. How many people ever saw a movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Raise your hand. All right. So I'm going to have to paint some illustrations here for those of you who don't know this movie. If you don't have that movie, go to Walmart and buy that movie and watch it with your family. It will be a, a good time. It's a good, good movie to watch. Jimmy Stewart is the uh, actor in that. And... Uh, It will move you. Isaiah chapter 35, beginning in verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and a shout of joy. <clears throat> the glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool, the thirsty ground springs of water, in the haunt, in the haunt of jackals, in its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go upon it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth, your word, uh, as we read from the prophet Isaiah and and hear his truth of the coming kingdom. Lord, we have hope that this world that we live in, this world where we are hurt, where we're bruised, where we are struggling sometimes, that hope will bring joy in the person of Jesus Christ, this babe in a manger, will indeed bring joy to the world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. Every time about this year, television stations uh, bring out their their walls that old black and white film that I talked about earlier. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, and George Bailey is the lead character. Uh, he is this in as you watch this heartwarming film. He's a guy uh, who never felt like he amounted to much in life. Maybe you can relate with him. He had dreams of becoming a famous architect, of traveling around the world. Instead, he feels trapped in this little humdrum job in a small town. And then a crisis occurs and strains his every uh, resource. He's faced with unjust criminal charges. And although he has, fine, has a fine family and many friends in the community, the injustice of the situation plunges him into despair. I might tell you that this injustice isn't something that happened to him on accident. It's some other guy in the movie that plotted it against him. But faced with this crisis, George Bailey breaks down and he goes to a bridge and he contemplates taking his life and he jumps over it. There's a guardian angel in this particular movie and his name's Clarence. <laughs> Remember him. He comes down to show what a community would be like without him after he gets him out of the river. The angel takes him back through his life 
and he shows George how his job has benefited many families, how his little kindness and thoughtful acts have changed the lives of other people, and how he, uh, how the ripples of George's love uh, towards those people spread throughout the entire world, making it a better place. George Bailey is, is played by that actor, uh, Jimmy Stewart, who's got that stalk like this, and I, 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 I struggle to speak sometimes. Kind of like that through the whole movie, you're watching this guy, seeing if he's going to get it out. Stewart says some things happened to him when you go back and recorded history that never happened in any one of his pictures when he has interviewed after doing this movie. Now, this interview occurs 40 years later, and he says this in one scene, George Bailey, broken and in despair, is supposed to sit at this little roadside restaurant, and in this scene, Jimmy Stewart, who's playing George Bailey, uh, raises his eyes uh, and following the script, and I quote, he says this in the movie, and this is a quote as he's playing this part, God, God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, God. That was his line in the movie. When he's interviewed, and I will read you the direct quote from his interview, Stewart says this is what occurs. He says, and I quote Jimmy Stewart, the actor playing that role, George Bailey. He says, as I said those words, I felt the loneliness, the hopelessness of people who had nowhere to turn and my eyes were filled with tears. I broke down sobbing after the scene. This was not planned at all. But the power of that prayer, the realization that our Father in heaven is there to help the hopeless had reduced me to tears, end quote. Jimmy Stewart would become a Christian later in his life. Exploring, is there a God of hope? Is there a God who in the midst of what we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis really wants to come in and change your life? He would find that. He would become a Christian. Now what's interesting is, I wonder how many people have been touched by that simple little film. I know one other historically significant event that occurred where one guy was. There's a guy by the name of Chuck Colson who tells about a guy who was uh, affected by this film. It's Chuck Colson was part of the Watergate deal and did some time for it. And there was another guy uh, later on in life, uh, Chuck Colson, uh, in part of that Watergate thing, when he had to go uh, into prison, he became a Christian in the prison while serving under, under the Watergate charges. He got out and started an entire ministry and started uh, affecting change in the world. And he bumped into a guy later in the 80s by the name of Robert McFarlane. <clears throat> Robert McFarlane was President Ronald Reagan's former national security advisor. And McFarlane had, had been indicted for his role in the Iran-Contra <coughs> affair. McFarlane was crushed. His career was ruined. In desperation, McFarlane had tried to commit suicide. And a stranger mailed him a video. Some of you kids don't know what that is. <laughs> This is, never mind, I'm not going to explain it. It's like a CD, but it's different. <laughs> a stranger mailed him a video of It's a Wonderful Life. And Robert McFarlane had never seen the movie. And in an interview later on, McFarlane said it was that movie that gave him the inspiration to go on. Interesting. The simple Christmas film gave him hope. Hope is what Christmas is all about. Later, Chuck Colson would lead Robert McFarlane to Christ and to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Two guys, big in the government, didn't want anything to do with God, had everything in the world, brought to a place where they needed to look up to find hope. That is what our scripture lesson for the day are all about. They're about hope that brings joy. Hope that brings joy. The first thing 
that Christ coming into the world means is hope for the hopeless. Hope for the hopeless. The George Baileys and the Robert McFarlands of our world have a reason to go on. Christ has come into our world. John the Baptist is in prison in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 5. You can flip over there if you want. Chapter 11 of Matthew, the gospel, verses 2 through 5. And it says, Now when John, while in prison, heard the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. John was a wilderness guy. We talked about that last week. So imprisonment must have been a pretty hard thing for this guy to deal with. When John hears about the, the news that Christ was doing, John sent him one of his followers over to ask the Christ if he was really the guy, if he was really the Messiah, if he was really the hope that was coming into this world, or should he expect somebody else? Jesus' reply is interesting. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. He's quoting out of Isaiah about the hope of the heaven that has come. He never once said to himself, I, I want you to notice, he never said, go back and tell John that 5,000 people came to hear me preach the other day. We didn't have enough to eat. So I fed them all. He didn't say, the world's, the word's spreading about my big miracle crusades. I should really draw the crowds in Jerusalem. No, he didn't say that. No, he says the blind receive sight. Church gets this. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. And the good news is preached to the poor. Notice that each of these, the blind, the lame, those with leprosy, the deaf, the poor, watch this, are people like you and me facing challenges. Are people like you and me, 2016, right where you are, facing a challenge or a stressor in your life? These are people who have major obstacles to overcome. These are people living generally on the charity of others. But these were the people for whom Jesus came. Jesus came to bring hope for the hopeless. Jesus came to bring hope for the hopeless. And that's the good news. Sometimes you and I are among the hopeless. Sometimes our hearts grow weary and, and our spirits sag a little bit. We need to know that Christ is there when things look dark, particularly at Christmas time. I don't know what it is, but every year in November and December, I do at least half or more of all the funerals I'll do in an entire year during November and December. I don't know what it is. I have a feeling that when a person is devoid of hope, which is, makes them devoid of joy, that depression sets in, causes us to struggle with things. I'll tell you the story of the store Santa. There's a lady by the name of Charlene Bombridge. <laughs> She knows what it's like to be sad at Christmas. Charlene might normally be called a Christmas enthusiast. One of those delightful people who takes joy at the tiniest detail of the holiday. The Yuletide season is a time of excitement, usually in her household. On, the, on, on this one particular year, Charlene decided to get her picture made with Santa. To give as a humorous gift to her husband and two grown sons. One afternoon at a nearby mall, she came across an unoccupied Santa and asked him if she could sit next to him and have her picture made. He seemed pretty pleased about the whole idea. So Charlene squeezed in next to him for her photo. 
And the congenial Mr. Claus turned to Charlene and with the obligatory twinkle in his eye, asked her what she wanted for Christmas. Without giving her brain time to engage, Charlene blurted out, Santa, I'm having a hysterectomy next Wednesday, and I'd like a swift healing. For a moment, Charlene was mortified at her own words, at her own bluntness. But this particular Santa looked her deep in the eye and said, I'll pray for you, and so will Mrs. Claus. Charlene, moved by his sincerity, started to cry, she writes. That was just what you needed to hear. She turned to walk away. She remarked, you know, you still come to my house every year in the middle of the night, even though my babies are 25 and older. That particular Santa with a warm smile said, I know. The one who placed me here for such a time as this has been there all along. What Charlene needed was a word of hope to create joy. And what has happened in this world 2,000 years ago, historically, is something that we cannot forget. Santa, who happened to be a strong Christian faith in that particular mall, gave a word of hope that created joy in a person's life. Christmas is all about hope to the hopeless that brings joy to our souls. Christmas is all about hope to the hopeless that brings joy to our souls. And it's another thing. It's about the healing for the hurting. Listen again to the words of Isaiah. He says, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. And they will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God has come. Your God will come. Then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams into the desert. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground bubbling springs. What a magnificent picture of healing and new life. It is the very thing that many people long for more than anything else, either for themselves or someone they love. You ever been hurting for somebody you love and you couldn't do a thing about it? You ever been hurting and there was nothing you could do about it? Church, catch this. God loves you more than you can possibly know. There's a story about a guy by the name of Mark Cruikshank. He's a big burly man. He owns two transmission repair shops in Chicago. And the story goes like this, a true story. It was about a year ago, Mark's wife, Debbie, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, about 2014, just about this time. As Mark watched the woman that he loved suffer, he tried to think of some way he could help her. Finally, he realized that all he could do was pray. Even then, he wasn't sure that was enough. So that last spring, as, as the time went by, instead of advertisements for oil changes and brake specials, which he usually did on his sign, the sign at the multi-state transmission repair read this. Please pray for Debbie. The cancer will go away. He didn't know what else to put. A stream of customers, many of them strangers, began stopping by to ask about Debbie after their prayers. Mark also began personally asking customers and businesses and colleagues to pray for his wife. People of every faith came by to offer their support. 
Some customers told Mark they, didn't, they hadn't prayed in 20 years until they saw that sign as they were driving by. But they would be praying for Debbie. And the months passed and Mark noticed a change in his wife and in himself. He had become pretty cynical about the human race. Let's face it, nobody likes to get their car fixed. They tend to be rude and grumpy. Mark was tired of dealing with unhappy people all the time. But after he posted the sign about his wife's cancer, he was amazed at the outpouring of love and support from his customers and even from total strangers. A few days before Christmas last year, 2015, the Crewshanks got the good news that Debbie's cancer was all gone. On Christmas Eve, Mark Cruikshank drove to his shops to post a new sign. Praise God, Debbie is winning her battle with cancer. And not everybody wins her battle with cancer. But we do know, but we do know that Christ's will is for healing. We never withheld healing from anyone who asked it in the blind, the deaf, the physically challenged. The coming of Christ means hope for the hopeless and healing for the hurting. Church, what we've got to get our minds wrapped around is this. And here's where we oftentimes forget. This gift that came in a manger 2,000 years ago was to fix, watch this, our eternal <coughs> state. Because whether we like it or not, you're going to live for an eternity. It's just a matter of whose backyard you're in. And Christ's fix, Christ's hope, was so that you would be with him for eternity. So that your loved ones would be with him for eternity. So that we would be united in eternity with our Savior. And that is our hope. And that is the thing that brings joy. That is the thing that, that makes us smile sometimes. Right where we are. When we realize really who is in control. And one more thing. The coming of Christ is joy for all who believe. You catch that, church? The coming of Christ is joy for all who believe. Isaiah writes, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness, he writes. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get upon it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Watch this. Everlasting joy. Joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Isaiah will mirror what we see a picture of heaven to be in Revelation where he says, There will be no more tears for you. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. The struggles you have in this world that you are desperately trying to fix on your own, I'm asking you, Jesus says, to give them to me. <coughs> Our God wants those things because he says, I've got a better way for you. But you've got to follow me. I was talking to somebody in the hallway earlier this morning about prayers answered in life. And almost every single time when God moves, almost every time when we say, when we get ourselves right, we say, God, hear me. And when we decide to hold his hand and walk with him, he starts to answer our prayer. And when life is going good for us and we're holding Jesus' hand and we're walking and everything seems to be good and we're doing the best that we can to go his way, oftentimes we'll let go because we're distracted by the world about something else. And we get caught up in this eddy. And we struggle. Church, this gift at Christmas means the struggle's over. That, that you have hope. And it's eternal. You see, the coming of Jesus brings joy. To be in his presence is heaven. That's what creates joy. When a prayer is answered and you're elated in that moment, 
and you have this goofy smile on your face. When someone gets saved and they got this goofy smile that you're just like, man, I've never seen them smile like that. That is joy because you've come to the presence of the person of Jesus Christ. There's a pastor <clears throat> who's from here in Louisiana, Don Aok. He tells about his father who worked in the oil fields, that he was an oil field hand here in Louisiana. But his job meant that he was on 24 hour call. He would often be gone from home for days at a time when trouble at the rig necessitated him being there. He was always busy, but in his crazy schedule, Don said he seldom felt cheated or deprived of time with his daddy. <coughs> During the summers and the holidays, their family would often go to a rig location where his father worked. Living here in Louisiana, his dad often had to work in Texas. So they would rent a little low-cost house wherever his dad was assigned. And Don and his older brother Glenn would go to the drilling site with their father at the rig, which is usually near a body of water, and they would fish. If they were near a marsh, they would hunt ducks. They never went on vacation in the usual sense because their father never had that kind of time or money to do that kind of thing. Watch this. Church, watch this. But he did know how to give attention to his children. One of the best Christmas dinners Pastor Don writes about. Actually, the best dinner that he says he had ever had was on one of these rigs. The rig was stacked, which means it was not operating for the holidays. And Don's dad had to usually stay with it to prevent theft. So Don, his mother, his sister Linda, and his brother Glenn stayed with their dad in the bunkhouse for several days during the Christmas break at school. On Christmas Day, his best memory and best Christmas. They ate Spam and crackers and drank Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Don says it was the most wonderful Christmas he had ever had. Why? Because they were with their daddy. And nothing else meant as much as that. That is the way believers feel in the presence of Jesus Christ. But if you don't know him, you can't know that joy. His coming means hope for the hopeless, help for the hurting, an unutterable joy for those who call him Lord. And that is what Christmas is all about. Christ has come into our world in the form of a tiny babe. And it's no wonder we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know <clears throat> joy in your life. For to know Jesus Christ is to have hope, healing, and joy. And if you need that, then you come as we stand and count. Our Heavenly Father, we come before